If you still recall this example from the previous video, we needed to determine the state of stress at point C in this composite beam that is subjected to the external loadings. So we first determined all the internal reactions at the cross section where point C is, and then evaluated one by one what stress was caused by each of the internal reactions, and then combined the stresses and represent them on the surface element at point C, and then we extended our results to a volume element at point C based on equilibrium and the complementary property of shear stress. And then we realized that we can reduce this general state of stress to planar state of stress. And that was the result of that example. Now, the question is, point C represents a particle with no size, no shape, and no orientation. We chose this volume element to represent this particle, and we chose the orientation because it was the most convenient. But what if the orientation at point C changes? Does the state of stress change as well? To answer this question, we will start the discussion of the plane stress transformation in this and the following couple of videos. The three-dimensional stress transformation is beyond this class. In these videos, we will learn to calculate the planar state of stress associated with the same particle at the same location but with a different orientation. We will also determine at what orientation the maximum normal stress or the maximum in-plane shear stress occurs. For example, for this particular element, we will determine that it is at this orientation where it has the maximum normal stress of 305.5 KSI with no in-plane shear stress. And if point C happens to be the weakest point of this member and the material is brittle, therefore it has a lower resistance to normal stress, it is likely it will fail along this plane in accordance to this orientation. On the other hand, for the same particle at a different orientation, it will have the maximum in-plane shear stress, 158 KSI. Once again, if point C happen to be the weakest point in this member, and if this material is ductile, which means that it has a lower resistance to shear stress, then it is likely this material will fail along this plane according to this orientation. Therefore, as you can see, it is important to understand stress transformation since this way we can better understand how the material behaves under loadings. Let's look at an example directly to see how we can find the stresses associated with a plane at a different orientation. Like in this example, we are given the general state of stress for a element, and we need to find the stresses along the AA plane, which is at a 30 degree angle with the vertical line. We will use a method that is in concept very similar to the method of sections. We will imagine this element is being cut by the AA plane, and we will pick this triangular segment for our analysis. On this triangular element, these are the stresses that are given, and on this inclined plane, we have a normal stress, sigma x prime, and a shear stress, that is tangential to this plane, that is tau x prime y prime, and these two are the unknowns that we need to determine. But don't forget, this element does have thickness. It is more like a wedge with a uniform thickness. Therefore, along this inclined plane, there is an area of A. And based on our trigonometry knowledge, we know that this area must be a times cosine 30 degree, and this area is A times sine 30 degree. And since stress times area gives us force, therefore, we can represent the forces associated with each of these surfaces on this element. Since these arrows now represent forces, 
This problem has become a force equilibrium problem, and we are very familiar with how to solve a force equilibrium problem. We set up our x y coordinate system. Resultant force along the x direction equals to zero. Resultant force along the y direction also equals to zero. We have two equations, two unknowns: sigma x prime and tau x prime y prime. Therefore, we are able to solve for both unknowns, and this answers this problem. As you probably noticed, during this approach, the two unknowns showed up in both of our two equations. Therefore, we had to solve two equations simultaneously. And for convenience, we would like to avoid solving a system of equations. Therefore, alternatively, we would like to set up our x prime y prime coordinate system along the directions of the new normal stress and the new shear stress that we need to solve for. Therefore, resultant force along the x prime direction equals to zero. Resultant force along the y prime direction equals to zero. The advantage of this alternative approach is that. Our unknowns only show up once in each of these two equations. Therefore, they can be solved independently, and the answer is the same. Based on the previous example, now we can derive the general equations that can be used to directly calculate the new stresses associated with a plane A A, which has a normal axis, the x prime axis. That is achieved by rotating the original x-axis counterclockwise by an angle theta. Notice that I put the plus signs in front of the four parameters sigma x, sigma y, tau x y, and theta, because these are considered the positive direction according to the sign convention. Particularly, the rotation is considered a positive if it is a counterclockwise rotation. Therefore, from the previous example, we replaced the numbers we used to have with parameters sigma x, sigma y, tau x y, and theta. Again, we set up our x prime y prime coordinate system according to the directions of the unknown normal stress and shear stress. Resultant force along the x prime direction equals to zero. Resultant force along the y prime direction equals to zero as well. And we can solve for our unknowns as expressions of the given parameters. This looks complicated. Let's see if we can simplify it. If you recall from trigonometry that sine two theta equals to two times sine theta cosine theta, and cosine two theta equals to cosine theta squared minus sine theta squared. If we substitute these two into our original equations, we can get these simplified equations. These are the general equations that we can use directly to calculate our new normal stress sigma x prime and shear stress tau x prime y prime. If you wonder what happens to sigma y prime, well, for this element, if we section it differently. And pick this segment for our analysis. Then normal stress sigma y prime is along this direction, and following a similar approach, we can derive the equation to calculate sigma y prime. Notice that the sum of sigma x prime and sigma y prime equals to sigma x plus sigma y, the sum of our original normal stresses. This is a very useful conclusion because this way we don't have to remember the equation to calculate sigma y prime. We can simply take advantage of the sum of the original two normal stresses. Let's look at another example. We need to determine the new state of stress for this particle at a rotated orientation. According to the x y coordinate system and the sign convention, we can tell that sigma x is negative forty megapascal because it is along the negative x direction. Sigma y is positive seventy megapascal, and if we compare the direction of the shear stress to the sign convention, we can tell that the shear stress is negative fifty megapascal. Now, since this coordinate system. Can be achieved by rotating the original coordinate system 
clockwise by 15 degree. Therefore, theta equals to negative 15. It is negative because counterclockwise rotation is considered a positive, and clockwise rotation is considered a negative. Therefore, we substitute all these numbers into the general equations. We can easily calculate the new normal stress along the x prime direction, normal stress along the y prime direction, and the new in plane shear stress. And this is how we can visualize the results. As you can see, these two squares represent the same particle at the same location but of different orientations. As a result, they have different states of stress.